Good morning, church. We are so glad you're here and that we have heat that works. So please stand up on your feet this morning. We're going to get started together just worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus. He's our hope in every circumstance. He's the reason that we can come together with joy each and every week. So let's just sing out together to him today. Amen. celebrate you for the work that you've done in each of our lives. We celebrate you because you're alive and that no matter what we face week in and week out through months and years of this life, Jesus, you are always good and always faithful. So today we just, we proclaim your goodness, Jesus. We proclaim your faithfulness. Help us to know it deep in our bones, God, that you are always good. It's in your name we pray this morning. Amen. This morning I'm going to read some scripture, and I've got my Bible up here, but I put it all on my phone because it's lots of different ones. So um, I thought these were appropriate for what we've been studying together lately. Um, this is John 14. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
Back at the well in John 4, Jesus tells the, this woman, he says, whoever drinks of the water I give him will never be thirsty again. The water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. John 6, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. You know, we, we run into a lot of wells in this life. Trying to, trying to satisfy our thirst and our hunger. But Jesus says if we'll just stay close to him, if we'll just keep coming back to him, he's got water that <laughs> satisfies us to where we'll never be thirsty again. So that's the reason we can come back to him over and over again. The reason we find solace in coming together and proclaiming this good news that we can have safety in Jesus. We can have a home in Jesus. We don't have to keep pursuing those things any longer. So I just invite you today, as we continue worshiping this morning, as we continue singing to Jesus, that you'd let go of those things that are wells that never satisfy. There's a prophecy in the Old Testament that says the people were digging cisterns that could hold no water. And um, I feel like we do that sometimes. So today, whatever that is, just lay it at the feet of Jesus and realize he can satisfy you. For my waking breath, for my daily bread, I depend on you. I depend on you for the sun to rise, for my sleep at night. I depend on you. I today, Jesus. Where the Spirit leads as I'm following. I depend on you. Oh, I depend on you for the victories still in front of Yes, I depend on you. You're the way, the truth, and the life. You're the well that never runs dry. I'm the branch and you are the vine. Draw me close and teach me to abide. Be my strength, my song in the night. Be my own. My treasure, my prize. I am yours forever, you are mine. Draw me close and teach me to abide. When I pass through death as I enter rest, I need. me 
Help us to proclaim. I depend on you. I depend on you. I depend on you. I depend on you. Yes, I depend on you. I depend on you. I depend on you, I depend on you. Jesus, today that's our prayer. We can sing it in here, we can say it out loud. And may our hearts truly believe it, that we can depend on you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Father, those three words that that Canaanite woman spoke to you in, in the scripture that we heard today was, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. So whatever it is that gets us to those three words, God, would you please help us? Help us today, Father, to know that you can be trusted in everything today. There is no wasted pain. There is no wasted heartache. God, there's not a building that burns to the ground that you're not aware of. Father, whether it's a church or someone's home, God, you are concerned. And Father, all the things in our life that has just been... Um, affected by a broken world, Lord, families and relationships and thought patterns. God, today we just need you to help us. Lord, may we just echo those words of that Canaanite woman. Lord, help me. In Christ's name. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still, and all Oh, praise the 
rising sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus face holy you're worthy of all of our praise. We need you, Lord. We're so thankful that we can come to meet with you, that we can carry you with us when we leave this place. Just teach us, Lord, that we're never alone when we believe and trust in you as our Lord. In your name I pray. Being a mom of, of little kids, there are times that I personally struggle with sitting down to spend time with the Lord or to play a game or to play Legos or just to sit and be with my kids. Or I struggle with that when there's stuff to be done. There's always something else to be done. There's always more laundry, dishes, errands that need to be run, things that need to be fixed. There's just always something else to do. Just the other day, I was so focused on accomplishing all the tasks of my day that I neglected to, you know, relationally spend time with my family. There have definitely been times where we've had families over and I'm more concerned about their comfort than I am about, you know, spending time with them. Like, I'm more worried about, is the, you know, is there enough food out? Is there enough drinks out? Is it the food they like? Is it the drinks that they like? I'm more concerned with, with hostessing and making sure everybody's happy and content that I don't, but I don't get to sit down and um, sit with them and spend time with them. When I let busyness win, I don't spend time with the Lord. Um, I don't make Him a priority. It causes me to want to control um, things that I can't control, but I feel like I should. Um, it makes me feel rushed. I am not able to fully engage with whatever it is I'm supposed to be doing at the time. And I get easily angered. I'm quick to speak and not quick to listen. I start real thinking that I'm enough. I start thinking that I can do it all. I start thinking that I'm capable. And then of course I always wind up disappointing myself. When I feel spiritually dry, I feel tired. I just feel empty and I feel like I'm kind of swimming upstream. I know that I'm not in control ultimately. Like, he has given me abilities, right? And he wants me to use my gifts and my talents to serve others and my family. Um, but when I start getting frantic, it's because I'm losing sight of him and I'm not abiding in him and I think I'm truly in control when I'm not. And I'm, I'm grateful that, you know, I have a husband that, that loves me and points me to Christ. And I have a community group that, um, you know, I can confess that to. And so I find um, that the Lord has taught me a great deal about just trusting in Him and in His plans for me. Um, and I've learned the hard way plenty of times that it's more important to me to sit and abide with my Lord. Um, to refresh my heart and get my, my mind and my heart kind of recentered where it needs to be. You know, since the first Sunday of the year, we've been talking about this, uh, the whole purpose of spending time with God. 
you know, one of the things that we try to make easily available to you is not just uh, through our app where you can keep up with the scripture and and also a way that you can access it today and begin to, to, to journal through that and ask the questions that go along with reading the scripture. Because we think that the time that you spend with God is the best time of your week and it's the best time of your day. Because if we're going to worship effectively on Sunday and, and our worship is going to be meaningful and life-altering and life-changing when we corporately gather, is that, that we've been gathering all week with God. We've been meeting with God and God has been preparing our heart for corporate worship. You know, we don't live here, you know. We come here, you know, but we live what we live and God wants to live in that with us. And that's that part of devotion and being devoted to him. So uh, um, today is no exception. We're going to kind of springboard off that passage that we looked at over the last few weeks. But, but, and we're going to talk about Mary and Martha. It seems like we can't get enough of, of, of Mary and Martha because we identify with them so easily. In fact, each of us in this room can identify with the fact that, that, that we are so much more like Martha than we are like Mary. You know, Mary um, was that woman that wanted to spend time at the feet of Jesus. Martha was that woman that wanted to be on her feet like the woman that we just saw in the, in the video. Busy, serving, you know, entertaining, making sure that everybody was cared for except herself. You know, but yet in our life, there has got to be balance. And over the last, last week, we talked about the balance in our life. And the balance of our life, what makes it balanced is our devotion. Our devotion to God. If we don't have a devotion with God or devotional time with God, we easily become imbalanced or unbalanced in our life. We, we have divided interests and divided heart. And God wants us to have an undivided heart. And that's what we spoke about. Today, we talked about, and uh, as we mentioned last week, we have a little mission statement around our church that says that, that we exist to lead people to become passionate followers of Jesus Christ in their community. And it says in their community and around the world to the glory of God. I mean, that's something you can say at one breath. But it takes your whole lifetime to live that. You know, we exist to lead people to become passionate followers of Jesus Christ. Passionate in our devotion to God. Evident in our walk with God. In our relationship with others. Because people know if they've been around you, they know if you've been around God, right? It should be evident that we've been around God when we're around our friends. Because they see it in us. They know something is different in us, about us. The scripture that, that we've been looking at is found in, in, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 10, verse 38. It says, while they were traveling, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. And she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. And the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice, and it will not be taken away from her. I mean, right there, we find what we've been looking at, there was Martha who was a poster child for distraction. I mean, listen to how distracted she was. Jesus is in the house. Maybe the disciples with Jesus were in the house. But regardless of all that was going on with Jesus there, she was distracted by many other things. Listen, I don't know if you do this in your own life, but you priority your life. And I, I guarantee you that if we're not careful, we can priority out of our life anything to do with Jesus. Because we got other things more important. We got other things that, that are more, uh, that gets our attention far more than our time with Jesus. You see it in Martha's life. Distracted by many things. 
distracted by all that was happening. And then on the flip side of that, you've got Mary. She was devotion. That is the, she's the poster child for devotion. I mean, she was in the same house. And Jesus was in the same house with Martha as with Mary. And yet Mary realized that this may never happen again. So I better take advantage of this. I better take advantage of the time that I get to spend with Jesus. When you read Luke 10 and read John 11 and John 12, and all three encounters in Mary's life, each time she's mentioned in each of those encounters, she is at the feet of Jesus. Isn't that something to be said about that? I mean, it was her brother, just like Martha's brother, Lazarus, that was dead. But she, Mary, was at the feet of Jesus. When John 11 showed up and Jesus had gotten there, he was perfectly late because he needed Lazarus to stink. And he gets there and Lazarus had been in the grave four days. And Martha runs out there and said, Oh, Jesus, if you would have just been here, he would have made it. You were the missing link. Our brother would still be alive. And then the word got back to Mary who was huddled up in the house with a broken heart. And she left that house, they thought, going to the tomb. But she was going to Jesus. And what did she do when she got there? She fell at the feet of Jesus. I mean, isn't that just devotion all over that? And she said those words just like Martha had said. She said them, but she said them from a different place. She said, oh, Jesus, if you'd have been here, my brother would still be alive. See, she said it from a heart of devotion, where, where Martha said it from a heart of distraction. You can see that, right? The Bible declares to us that, that in the King James, it, when it quotes that verse 42 of, of Luke 10, it says, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. In the Christian Standard Bible, it says the right choice. The King James says it was the good part. In other words, for, for her, it was good for Mary, it was good to be at the feet of Jesus. And that word good, we get words like right, pleasing, beneficial. All of that is a part of that. You know, that's what she was doing. But for Martha, if you look at Mary's life, she chose the good part. For Martha, what did she do? Her life could be characterized by busyness. Think about how busy all of us are. We all have the same amount of time in each day. Everybody has the same. Nobody gets more. Nobody gets less. The question we have for all of us is so what do we do in our busyness? What do we do? Someone said that busyness is not of the devil. Busyness is the devil. Because it's a lot easier to check the box that we came to church than it is to check the box that we became the church. Because you can check that box every Sunday. And that box just jumps right up there. I attended church today. Check. But it takes your whole life to become the church. To be the church. That is something that's always in front of you. Living out our faith. If Martha could be characterized by busyness, Mary could be characterized by blessings. I mean, think about it. Every time she's mentioned, she's at the feet of Jesus. What is happening when she's at the feet of Jesus? She is not being disappointed. She is being blessed by spending time with Jesus. She's blessed by that. And by the way, folks, spending time with Jesus blesses us every day. That time of your day that you spend time with Jesus, you never disappoint that time, uh, the, the time that you spend with Jesus. You are disappointed in the time that you don't spend with him. Mary was blessing. Why? Because she knew that spending time with Jesus and being at the feet of Jesus would bless her. And we're going to run just through a few things that it blesses us with. 
If we spend time with Jesus in our devotion and we carve out time every day to be with him, it blesses us personally. That's why when you have a relationship with God, you don't have a relationship based upon granny or your mama or your daddy. You have a personal relationship with Christ. And let me tell you how the personal part of that, it is communication. You cannot have a personal relationship with someone unless you spend time with them, right? Spending time with Jesus blesses us personally. I mean, imagine that. The scripture speaks of words like this, for me to live is Christ. Imagine this. The psalmist says, the Lord is my shepherd. The psalmist says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength and my life. From whom shall I be afraid? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if any man is in Christ, they are a new creation. Colossians talks about being in Christ. 164 times is referred to in the Bible of being in Christ Jesus. So what does that tell us? It is a personal relationship, right? It's individual. It is personal. It blesses everything about our life. Our whole life is blessed by being with Jesus. Several years ago, there was a lady in our church that's just up and was gone. We couldn't find her. I mean, she still owned a house in Moody, and she just collected mail there, but she'd been in rehab centers and physical rehab centers. She'd been in the hospital and and moved from here to there and everywhere. And then last week, I just happened to be in Walmart, and I saw a lady that came with her to church years ago, and I said, boy, I sure do miss old Betty Frank. I'd give anything to see old Betty Frank. I wish I knew where she was down in Florida with her daughter. Says, Betty's not in Florida. Betty's at Fairhaven. Fairhaven? She said, yeah, she's at Fairhaven. So I lickety split went to Fairhaven. And I walked in the room 222 at Fairhaven. And there was Betty. And man, I sat there with Betty. And you don't need to know this, but it's pretty neat to know this. Betty Frank became the Secretary of State for the state of Alabama at age 25. Her husband was Bill Frank. Bill and Betty, they owned the $3 bill stores. Betty Frank, at age 25, became the Secretary of State, and she had no interest in politics. Other than she wanted to support those who were running for office, but not to be in office. And one day her husband took her for a ride in the car. Said, I've got something to show you. Cover your eyes. And they were on what she called was the Florida shortcut. And as they came along, he pulled over on the side of the road. He said, open up your eyes, Betty, and look. And he looked up, she looked up on the sign, and there was a massive sign in front of her. And Bill had entered Betty into the race for the Secretary of State. And there was a big picture of Betty. Vote Betty Frank, Secretary of State. It says, who is Betty Frank? What's her line? Is what Bill put on that sign. What's her line? Is it arts? Is it science? Is it politics? And Betty Frank said, I didn't want to run for that. She said, and Bill said, oh, yes, you would be a great Secretary of State. She ran and she won at age 25. Secretary of State. In 1959, she entered the office. John Patterson was the governor. Then I found out that after that four-year term was up, she went on to become the, uh, a, a person that was a state auditor under George Wallace and Bob James. It's an amazing story. But what made Betty Frink's story so amazing was this. That Betty Frink told me on August 8, 1963, which was a Thursday night, she had gone to bed. 
And laying in her bed, she was so convicted to the core of her heart with conviction that she could not take it anymore. So she got out of her bed. She knelt beside the bed, and she looked over on the coffee table, uh, on the end table beside her husband's side of the bed, and it was her, his Bible. She went and got it, and when she held it in her hand, she said, I felt so filthy myself because of the sin in my life. I opened up that Bible. And I just laid my face in it, and I read it, and that night I gave my whole life to Jesus. And she said, I was just, man, I was just rocking right along. I was finishing up. I was 29 years old. I was a a secretary of state. I had everything going for me. I had a husband and two kids. I had everything. And the most needful thing in my life was Jesus. I think we have a picture of Betty that I, that I took. There's Betty right there. I sat there and talked to Betty, and, and Betty and I reminisced, and we walked down all of those things. She said, I, she said there was one thing that people asked about me when I committed my life to Christ. It says, don't you feel like it's, if it's really real? And she said, I'm going to tell you, I couldn't deny it if I wanted to deny it because Jesus changed my life. Can I tell you, that's what devotion with Jesus It reminds us that there's a relationship that needs to happen. And that happens when we spend time. We know that he is real and we trust him with our life. The Bible uses words like this. And in just a moment, we'll look at Psalms 1. But but Robert Frost, in the end of that little uh, poem on the two roads that diverged in the wood, that has been misunderstood for years. But it goes like this. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Betty Frank told me there was two roads I was on. One was I was going down this road, and I wanted to be known. I wanted to be a person in charge. And then I came to that place place beside that bed and I realized there is another road the road less traveled and I wanted that road and that road has changed my life when the psalmist speaks he talks about those two roads in Psalms 1 it says happy is the one or blessed is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway with sinners nor sit in the company of smockers instead his delight is in the Lord's instruction and he meditates on it day and night he is like a tree planted beside flowing streams and bears its fruit in its season and its leaf also does not wither whatever he does prospers the wicked are not like this instead they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. But the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, and the way of the wicked leads to ruin. Man, you ought to memorize Psalm 1. Because it tells you about those two roads. One road leads to blessing, the other road leads to ruin. And the way we know the way to blessing is through the word of God. I have meditated on your word day and night. See, that's the blessed life, isn't it? It blesses our life personally. You don't have to get old and wore out like me to realize that we need a blessed life. You need a blessed life when when you're young and you're full of energy and you're full of imagination. You need God to harness all of that and govern all of that in your life so that he can get the maximum benefit from your youth. Because God wants to be glorified in your youth. God wants to be glorified in all the activities of our life. God wants us to be blessed personally. That not only are we blessed personally, but spending time with Jesus blesses us relationally. I mean, I think back over my life. My goodness. You know, we don't even know how to love right till we've been loved right by God. We don't really know how to love our kids. We can't really love the children that God gives us until we love the one who's given us, uh, us as children. We don't really know how to love until we've truly been loved by God. That's why when Paul wrote in Corinthians, he said, love is patient. Love is kind. Don't you hate it that he starts out with that? Love is patient. I 
know that you're not impatient, but I'm impatient. But the Bible says love is patient. God is patient. God is at work. God is doing things in our life. Relationally, it may be difficult now, but hang in there. It will get better in time. Why? Because love conquers. Love is better than all things. In fact, he ends up that passage. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Love. Can I tell you, relational love happens when there is a relational love affair with God. And that comes from spending time with him. You learn to love what he loves when you know what he loves. And things change. Devotion, spending time with Jesus, not only blesses us relationally, but it it blesses us spiritually. I mean, think about it. We love him And we listen to him. We're concerned at what he has to say to us through his word. And then we're on the flip side of that. We want to listen to him. We want to grow and be like him. Not less like him, but more like him. Can I tell you, that's what a disciple is. When Paul spoke of his experiences growing up and and falling and learning at the feet of Gamiel, he said, I learned at the feet. In fact, over and over again, the scripture speaks of people being at people's feet. The whole purpose of being at someone's feet is submissiveness. And can I tell you, that's where spiritual maturity happens in our life, when we're submissive to God. We're submissive to his authority. We're submissive to his truth. We're submissive to the things that he wants us to do. We're submissive. And that blesses us. That makes us more and more like Christ, being with him, being at his feet. Mary was just like that. She was submissive. She was at the feet of Jesus. And then when you get to John 12, Jesus is there getting ready to go to the cross. And he hadn't even been properly anointed to go to the cross. And all of that hadn't been done. But what did she do? She took spike nard, costly perfume, poured it on his head and his feet and wiped, wiped his feet with her hair. Why did she do that? Because she had been blessed so much by the best. How could she hold back a whole year's wage of a costly perfume? She didn't waste it. She gave it. She poured it on the body of Jesus. Many people think that even when Jesus was taken and beaten to the moment of death, and when he was stripped of his garments, you could probably still pick up the faint smell of the spikenard because it had just resonated on the skin of Jesus. And who did that? That was Mary, who was blessed by God. That was Mary who understood what it meant to be blessed spiritually. See, devotion to God and spending time in devotion to God creates all these opportunities for these blessings to happen. But there's the ultimate thing. We will one day realize that we will be blessed for all eternity. We are blessed eternally in Christ. We have eternal blessings in Jesus Christ. This is not all there is. It will come to a screeching halt and it will for every one of us. But the beauty of it, spending time with Jesus blesses us eternally. In fact, the scripture says in Mark 10, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. God's truth will never pass away. This building will pass away. Everything you own will pass away. You will pass away. But the word of God will never pass away. 
And we're blessed in Christ. John 11, in that passage where Jesus came to Mary and Martha and where Lazarus was dead, he spoke words like this, I am the resurrection and the life, and the one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? I mean, do you believe it? Do you believe that Jesus... It's the one who gives us life eternal. Do you believe that Jesus blesses us with eternal blessings? Do you believe that Jesus Christ one day will take this fallen, broken body and it will be folded up like a tent and put in a box somewhere or hung on a mantle somewhere, but it will ultimately get in somebody's box. And one day when all of that happens because of our faith in Christ, at that moment of our death, we will go into the presence of Jesus. I grew up in Lowndes County, Mississippi, and my best friend growing up and it was a, a, a guy by the name of Shan Higdon. Shan and I went to the same school together, and, and when Lori and I started dating, Shan and his girlfriend, Teresa Barksdale, I think it was, they were dating, and we double dated. Now, it, it was double pagan dating, right? It was no Christian, no Bible between us. You know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't, wouldn't want to disrupt our pagan life with that. Well, that's the way we lived, right? And Shane and I, Shan and I just became just fast buds. And then one day he broke up with Teresa and then a few years later Lori and I were married and then I became a Christian and that was the end of Shan. I've seen him three times at daddy's funeral, mother's funeral, and my sister's funeral. I got COVID a few years ago and thought this was the end of it all and he, he would call Lori and and talked to Lori and then finally talked to me one day on the phone when I couldn't even speak. He said, you've got to get better, brother. You've got to get better. That was the last of our conversation. Well, this past Tuesday, Shan and his wife, Deborah Ann, we got a picture of them. They both uh, retired. 1-1-2023 one, one, was their last day at Echo Nobel, a chemical plant. She was a chemist. He worked in the, the plant as a supervisor. They decided, man, we're young. We need to spend time. We need to go places. In fact, he told me, he says, one of the last good conversations we had, he, she said, he said, as soon as we get over this COVID thing, we're getting in our car and we're going to Leeds, Alabama, and I'm going to walk in that church where Brother Billy, where Billy, Billy speaks, and I'm going to sit there because I've always wanted to go hear him preach. The reason I called him because last Tuesday he fixed his wife breakfast, pancakes and sausage. She drank some orange juice and they sat on the couch, just retired, both of them in house arrest for COVID. She had a little heart issue in December. They had to put a pacemaker in, just temporary. Had a little problem with the lead two or three times and she had just gotten out on like the 7th or the 8th and they both came home with COVID from the hospital and they're sitting there and, and, and Shan said, we're just talking. We just got all the plans in the world. We're going to retire young and go places. Then all of a sudden, she breathed one breath and she was gone, just like that. So when I found out about it, I called Shan said, Shan, I can't believe it, brother. He said, Billy, this is what you, sh this is what blows me away. My wife just a, a little while ago went to church with our son. It was at church at Mount Vernon Baptist Church where Lori and I were married. Mount Vernon Baptist Church. She went to that church and during the invitation, a lifelong Roman Catholic who had a relationship with the church but not with Jesus, knew it, went forward 
gave her whole life to Jesus, couldn't get home to Ethelsville, Alabama fast enough to say, Shan, you're not going to believe it. I wouldn't plan on going to church. I wouldn't even plan on getting saved today. But I went there, and I didn't tell you where I was going, but I went with our son, and I gave my life to Jesus today. And Shan said, you know, Billy, I sat beside her one minute, and in the next minute, She's home with Jesus. Listen, I don't know what eternal blessings look like for you. Maybe it's keeping your own teeth like Ron's mom prods herself on. Maybe it's having a head full of hair or maybe having more friends than you got money. Or maybe it's just whatever. But what God gives us in Christ Jesus is something that the world can't take from us because it's in Christ Jesus. And we have eternal blessing that knows that in Christ we will not be disappointed now and we will not be disappointed for eternity. Listen, that's why we should be devoted to Jesus. To be blessed personally, relationally, spiritually, and eternally. Blessed by the best who is Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, today we, we need to let our minds go back to that Canaanite woman again and see that in that very woman was that faith that she had that, that what was broken in her life could be fixed by you, Jesus. And those three words, Lord, help me. Lord, those are the words that we cry out to you. Lord, help me. For some of you today, you come into this room and you know, you know, you know that, that you're easily distracted. You're, you're busy like a Martha and you need to be devoted like a Mary. And, and you don't know how to, what that would, should look like and what that's going to look like. But you need help and you need to say, Lord, help me. I surrender at your feet today and I ask you to help me. Help me to love rightly in my home. Help me to love rightly in my marriage. Help me to love rightly even when the marriage has not worked out, God, and, and the papers are signed and nestled away in a in a drawer somewhere, but yet the pain is real. The absence is real. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Help me to forgive. Help me, God, to, to not just look toward a day that I will get to do something. Help us today to understand that we wake up with opportunities every day to love you and to love the people you love. So, Father, for that man or woman that's just never really yielded their whole life today, help us to submit to you. Say today, Father, I give it all to you. Everything I have is yours. I submit to you. I give you my sin. I give you my disappointments. I give you everything today. And I, ex I, I receive from you the very thing that I need more than any, and that is forgiveness. Lord, I want eternal life. Not that I might die today, but that I might live tomorrow, God. I want you eternally to bless my life. Change me, O oh Lord Jesus.
during this invitation hymn, would you just let this be a time that God is drawing you to himself, to himself. Is the 